So we're in the sermon series called Broken. If it's your first time here, this is our third week in it. And uh, we're going to kind of recap some things um, to kind of catch everybody up. But one of the reasons that I, I, I've done this ser- a version of the sermon series probably about four years ago. And if you were here when we were running like 50 people, you probably remember this a little bit. But one of the reasons I think it's important for two reasons. Uh, our purpose statement, win, train, send. Win people to Christ, train them up in the Lord, and send them back out in the community to do ministry. It is like our vision statement. It's like our vision statement to uh, serve your family. That's why we have, that's why we're open all day, our coffee shop. Uh, we do youth sports here in the evening. We have daycare. The, the, the purpose is, and the way we built our church is to serve your family. And, and then the reason we want to do that, the, the second part of that is to grow your ministry. Every Christian should have a ministry. God's trying to work through you, and uh, we have to be open up to that. And that's one of the things that we want to learn. And it doesn't matter the age. It doesn't matter what your background. Listen, God want, he said in his Bible that you have, no va- you have no measure to your value. You're extremely important to him. Why? Because uh, he's remade you. He's transforming and renewing us when we, when we get saved. And listen, you have a ministry. And so as we're talking about our ministry, we realize that we live in a broken world. Uh, the last couple of weeks, we understand because um, the first man, first woman, they, most commentators agree they were living in the garden for a little over 100 years before this mistake, before this sin against God. They knew God's word, they even repeated it. Uh, We read that specifically. And because of that, our world is broken, right? We have death and pain and suffering and and, uh, we do ministry in the real world. And there are real struggles. There's real sin and temptation, but there's also pain and suffering. I mean, why is it? Do we go to the world and we say, hey, listen, we can be set free and we can be healed and, and, and God has saved us, right? But yet so many things are still true, like the person that gets abused when they're a child, uh, the person um, that loses their job or somebody that gets sick and dies. And and then a lot of the minor things in life, they cease to matter and truth is the only thing that matters. And so that's when we have a ministry, your ministry and my ministry could be the same people um, out in the world and, and we need to have real answers. What's the reason we're gonna have war, death, famine, pain, sickness, hunger, all those things? Because we live in a fallen world. Uh, You're you're not gonna last forever. Even if you've had the American dream, even if you live to be a wise old age, uh, listen, your body doesn't last forever. You might might view that as as that's more blessed or whatever. Uh, You might think, well, that's the fair life. If, if If you go through life and you have a family and you do some of the things you wanna do, that's the fair life. Listen. Death, pain, and suffering are not fair. Uh, it's, not, it's, you know, it's not the way God made the world, but it's the way that, that the world's broken. Now, the, the great thing that we tell the world is, listen, the truth of the Bible is God saved it. You, you know, God offers salvation. This is not heaven. This body don't last forever, but there's one coming. And, and salvation is simple, amen? You believe in God and you're saved by grace. That's simple, and people uh, then, you know, show us by biblical baptism, and they start living their life for Christ. But you can take parts of those life, and you can and you can live in this broken model. We grow up, we live in a broken model with curses, and this is what we're concentrating on uh, last couple of weeks. And I'm excited to bring this to you because. Uh, I think we learn together, and we learn together, we can grow together. When we grow, when you grow in God's word, what happens is something amazing is that God takes the parts of your life that you've been living in sin, or the, you've been living in this broken world with the effects of sin, and he starts transforming it and remaking it, and he does miracles. And, and even though, like, right, the great stories of the church, people with testimonies, listen, I lived it my way, I did it my way. The great testimonies of the church, God goes behind that and he repairs some of the damage and, and, and in a miracle type way, he repairs the damage that we might've done 15, 20 years, maybe our whole life, but God can repair that and he makes it new. And so we're, that's what we're talking about this morning. We read uh, two weeks ago in Genesis chapter three, verse one through seven, we did that the first week. We saw what was done 
What, what was done right there in the beginning of Genesis chapter three was, did God really say that? Did God really say you'll die? See, Eve, well, the first woman, we see that he's, she's named in just a minute. Did God really say this? And, and she said, yes, God said this. Uh, and if we're not to eat of the fruit of that tree or we'll die, you'll not surely die. And that's true because, right, we can sin and not immediately die. We live our life and then it's at least sometimes, sometimes you, people sin and the type of sin, they immediately die or pretty soon after that. But in the case of Adam and Eve, they lived a long time, but immediately, what? They were separated from God spiritually. Their spirit could not eternally dwell with God at that moment. And then secondly, they did die later. They did die. So the sin did cause death, but in a way you can see how the lie worked. Well, you'll, you won't die. And we buy that all the time, right? Does God, does God re, word really say this about my marriage? Does it really say that? Does it really say this about uh, morality? Does it really say this about forgiveness? I don't wanna forgive. I, I, I wanna hold, I wanna do it my way. Does it really say that? Does it really say this about my money? I wanna do this and this. And so we get these ideas and we live pockets, even if we're a Christian, we live pockets of our life broken so that God isn't going to remake those. And, and, they're going, and then we're gonna suffer in this life because it's broken. And so these are the questions that we have. And we find ourselves, because of our desire to sin, we question God. There's, there's no question, if, if I didn't desire something, there'd, there'd be no reason to question it, right? And, and, and we, we, we learned from God's word last week that the reason we doubt and question God isn't, listen, when we, want, when we have a question about what truth is, we go to the Bible. The Bible is truth. But when we have a question that we want answered, it's time to look at the Bible. But you know, some people don't want answers to that question. Like some of you, maybe you hit a point in your life and you're like, I just wanna ask questions, man, right? What's, let's, let's ask the question and then let's ask it again. And let's ask, but when you're ready for truth, some people don't want truth. They just wanna keep asking the question, over, what's your answer? What's your answer? My, my answer is what difference does it make? If I have an answer and it's different than the Bible, what difference does my answer make? It might not be true, it probably isn't. If, if, it, if it stands against God's word, it's false as a matter of fact. That's what the Bible claims. And so when we look, when we look for truth about why things are the way they are, why I struggle the way I struggle, why you struggle, listen, we gotta look to the Bible. And really sometimes, even if we're doing like, hey, I'm gonna read the Bible in one year, I'm gonna read the Bible in six months, we can blow past uh, Genesis chapter three, and we'll miss all the important lessons. So that's why we're doing this together. So the next week, we looked at Genesis uh, chapter three, verses eight through 13, and we saw that for the first time, we have shame and blame, right? We learned that last week. What happened when Adam, the first male and the first female, the bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, right? This is what Adam calls Eve before he names her later. What happened when the, their spirit was separated from God? Commentators a lot of times, they, they realized they were naked. And you're gonna say, Austin, how could they live for over 100 years and not know they were naked? Well, what we find out in the case with God, when you're in the presence of God, humans early on, uh, Adam and Eve, they would have been clothed in light. And we see that uh, same thing kind of happened with Moses, is his face, when he was in the presence of the Lord, his face uh, had, was kind of like shining and they wanted him to wear a veil. But, but in a fallen state, it's not gonna happen like it was perfectly. And so with Adam and Eve, most commentators agree that, they, that when they uh, did the sin, that they immediately, their light started to fade, it went away and they realized, uh-oh, something's wrong. And so they felt shame about that and they hid from God. And when God asked them, we see uh, something that both you and I still do today, men in the room, we still do this, we blame God and the woman in less than a sentence. What did you do, Adam? Well, this woman that you created and put here with me, she did it, it was her fault. And we've been doing this ever since, right? And I'm, I mean, let's, we've been perfecting this blaming thing over the last several thousand years. It's in our DNA. Like um, somebody this morning was telling me that uh, they put uh, together an entertainment center, right? 
And how many guys have put together an entertainment center, like a, anything that's like a particle board and you've got to put it together. Like they put it in a box. It's, it's, it's hardly any money. And you're like, yes, I'm going to have this coffee tail. I'm going to have something that looks cool. And then you have to put it together and you're like me. And I instantly blame the dumb guy that wrote the instructions. Doesn't even work. Look at this thing. It's backwards. I got to spend another two hours taking it apart with the little Allen wrench that they give you. My hand's wearing out. It's backwards. The board doesn't fit. And immediately, I don't think I'm wrong. I think the guy that wrote the pamphlet's wrong. Why? Because Adam, he blamed God and woman. I'm only just blaming the guy that wrote the pamphlet. Anyway, and then I look at it and I figure out, okay, it's right. That was labeled the wrong one and you, and, you, and you go back through it. But right, we blame. We feel shamed or we get a little angry and we gotta find somebody to blame. And Eve does the same thing. She says, the devil made me do it. What did you do, Eve? Oh, I made a bad choice. No, that's not what she said. The serpent. Satan did this. I'm an innocent bystander. Yeah, I did it, but he made me do it. And so we've been doing this, but the, but the evidence of the fall, the thing that we deal with every day in our life that's broken, that represents broken and, and will cause our life to be ineffective in ministry, for the world to look in at the church and say, well, wait, I thought you were healed and saved and set free and it was so great, but look, look at you. You blame all the time. How do I know that I'm suffering and living in the broken part of being uh, of shame and blame? Remember we talked about last week too that, that blame is also accusing and the accuser in the Bible is Satan. So we don't want to emulate the accuser. But listen, if you live your life in shame, you will be an accuser. You will blame the people. You will look, right? We do this in church sometimes. This is how we do it. We don't like other people's sin, do we? Right? So there are a lot of things that represent uh, this blame in the church. One of them is slander. Slander's in, in the list of things with of all the major sins in the New Testament. It'll be right in there, slander. But let's say somebody who's involved in lots of different kinds of slander and gossip and uh, materialism and selfishness and greed and all those, all those things. Let's say uh, somebody that's been a Christian a long time, uh, maybe an older woman in the faith and then, then uh, somebody new comes in the church and maybe they're not quite dressed appropriate enough for them, right? And this new person. They feel like it's their spiritual act of worship to go and say, oh, look, I can see what's wrong with you. <laughs> You're not near as spiritual as me. There's something wrong with you. Look at the way you're dressed. And then they tell people, did you see so, how so-and-so was dressed today, blah, blah. And, and it's, it's, not, it's not a conviction. I want to shame you. I want to accuse you. And this is not from God. Conviction is from God, and there's a way to do that through the body. We love each other. We serve each other. We, get, we earn that permission to speak into somebody's life. But instead, when we're involved in this broken, sinful life, described in Genesis, we want to shame people because we, we want the recognition and, and we, don't, we don't like our own sin and we feel ashamed so we blame other people. Look, look how you're dressed. I don't like your sin. Your sin's worse than my sin, right? We do that. And that's an unhealthy church, so we don't want to do that. But we learned um, some amazing things in the very first few verses of Genesis chapter 3. Today, um, if you've never been through this series before, I hope that you learned something today that's going to affect your life. Here's another one of the base things. We're going to be looking in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. If you will pay attention today, this will be something that not only helps your ministry, but can change your life. Now today, in that, I'm going to teach you the dirtiest word you've ever heard. You interested now? Some of you are sick. That's the only reason you're ready now, because I said that. But it's true. I'm going to teach you the dirty, because, right, so somebody, let's say you get up in the morning, right? It's cold. You're walking through the house, and you kick the coffee table with your big toe, right? Now, I know some of you hardly ever say a naughty word, but I know some of you, and you got a problem, right? You haven't tamed the tongue yet, right? And you say naughty words all the time, and, and, and you don't care who hears. And when you stub that toe, man, there's a word that you think sounds so dirty, and you yell it, even though you shouldn't, you know, but you do. And you yell it, and you're like, that's a bad word. Oh, man, I'm, I have a filthy mouth. Okay, that word, whatever just came to your mind, 
does not compare to the word we're gonna look at this morning. I'll tell you why. All right, now that you're all interested, uh, Genesis chapter three, 14 through 20. Now, again, sometimes we read different versions of the Bible. Why do we do that? Because some of them are more correct from the translation from Greek or Hebrew than others. Today, we're gonna look at three in, in one verse, but we're gonna read this in King James, and I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit so that you can see uh, how it was correctly uh, written and read to us, okay? It says, and the Lord God said unto the serpent, because you've done this, you're cursed above all the cattle and every beast of the field. Upon your belly you shall go and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I'll put uh, a struggle between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head and you shall bruise his heel. And unto the woman he said, I'll greatly multiply your sorrow on conception and sorrow to bring forth children. And the desire shall be to your husband and he shall rule over you. And unto Adam he said, because uh, thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, because you listened to your wife and you, you ate of the fruit of the tree, which I commanded you say, don't eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Thorn and thistle shall bring forth thee and, and, you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground for it was, uh, for that's where you were taken for dust you were made and dust you'll return. Okay, and then Adam calls his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. So we have a lot that just happened here and a lot that you and I feel and affects our ministry and our daily life and all our relationships and marriages and, and, and our work and everybody we're friends with, this affects them. And, and there's a specific verse that is a little confusing, so we're gonna read it. We're gonna read the King James Version first again in uh, verse 16. It says, and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over you. And I know what all you guys are thinking, that sounds pretty good. Right? You're going to get married, and it doesn't sound like a curse, does it? Because of this curse, my wife's going to really desire me, and I get to rule over her. Sounds good to me. Thanks for that curse. Isn't that what you think? Okay, it's not what you think. Okay, NIV says this. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Why do we read King James and NIV? Because they're the two most popular versions. Everyone has a King James or a New International Version almost. But the reason we look at more than one translation is because the meaning of word change. And when King James was written, even though it was very accurate, the word desire does not mean uh, some of the things that it means today. So we're gonna look at the English Standard Version, which got this particular verse a little bit better. 316, it says, uh, your desire shall be contrary to your husband and he shall rule over you. Okay, now that changes things, doesn't it? That's not quite as appealing to everybody as the one before, except for the women are probably you know, glad the other one isn't true. So, so, so we've got a problem, what's the problem? And it's, by the way, this isn't just a problem for uh, the man and wife, it's a problem for the family, and we see that a little bit later. So this is, this is the word desire in this, or uh, desire contrary. So it, this, this, I'm gonna teach you a Hebrew word this morning. You ready for this? The, the Hebrew word printed up on the screen is called teshuka, okay? Teshuka, we put it in red because it's extra naughty, whatever. Okay, teshuka, ready? Uh, say it with me on the count of three. One, two, three, teshuka. Say it a little, let's do it a little bit better. Wake up a little bit. One, two, three, teshuka. Okay, I'm disappointed because you all just said a super naughty word, okay? <laughs> you said a naughty word, I'm disappointed in you. I thought you were a little more Christian than that. Okay, just kidding. But you're not gonna go around what makes this, this word so bad, I don't believe that tomorrow you're gonna stub your foot or cut your hand and you're gonna be like, oh, Teshuka! I don't think you're gonna do that, okay? So you, we're, we're all fine there, right? So, so we're good. But this, this, uh, this, this word is a bad word. The, the connotation of this word is completely cursed. And, and what it means is uh, to long for, to have desire for somebody else's position, to compete with them. And so in the first relationship, in the first family, we have a huge problem, the curse of the sin. And, and so many of the things that you experience, right? Uh, in marriage, listen, if you don't have God in the center, you're going to have desire 
for where the other person's at. I want, if you have a good feeling, if the other person feels served, if the other person feels uh, forgiven and you don't, what's your desire? I gotta get what they have. I gotta get it. I gotta have what they have. Listen, it, it's the reason we have 50% of people getting divorced. Why? Uh, all kinds of different reasons, but this is it. This is the desire. I, I don't have what I want, right? This is the reason we gotta keep up with the Joneses, a kind of an old term. But this is the reason if so-and-so's got a house that looks like this and so-and-so's got a car, I gotta have one too. I want that. Why? Because somebody else has it. This is, this is the curse uh, that came from our own free will. And we live with this. In fact, we compare our lives to everybody else's all the time. Why does Facebook look so good, right? Why do we put, why does everybody, no matter what they're doing, put perfect, look, I gotta have a family like that, why? Because they look like they're having a good time. They're all smiling, look, Facebook, it's true. It doesn't matter if a week later that family's completely broke up through all kinds of different things and they hate each other, but on Facebook they smile, why? I gotta have that, our family's not quite as happy. What, uh, we, we go to a movie, there's a romantic comedy, right? Romantic comedies are like pornography for women, right? Why? We gotta have that relationship. I gotta have it just like that. You gotta be cute and funny and ride the go-karts and bring me flowers. And Why? I gotta have that, because look, somebody else has got it, right? It's the Tashuka, it's, it's this curse that comes down, and, and he says, listen, this is gonna be, you're gonna want what other people have in, in a sick, cursed way, and you need to have victory over it. And here's the nice thing as we talk about this. Jesus died on the cross, and we have the Holy Spirit of God, and we don't have to live in this curse but we choose to and it looks broken to the world. It looks broken to the world and when our desire, when I want what I see that somebody else has, it causes me to question God. And so even your relationships in Christ, if you don't address this, this will cause you to question God's word. Did God really say that? Because I want that. I want that relationship I don't have. How many of you guys felt? Everybody's felt like this. In fact, most of the time we figure out what we don't have and what we want, right? We learned last week in middle school. I run a club on middle school, uh, Mickle Middle School on Tuesdays. Listen, you don't have to be there five minutes before somebody says, well, you, you don't have what I have because you're, you're, uh, you're a little fat, you're a little ugly. You're not a real man. You're not pretty enough, you know, right? And we spend the, the, the rest of our life going, listen, I want that. What that other person said I wasn't and they had it, I want that. And we, we spin our wheels and, and the great testimonies of our church are spent breaking down uh, those insecurities, that shame and that competition for what other people, the great testimonies. Hey, I spent 20 years, I was going after the world, I was trying to get all these things, right? These are the great testimonies of our church, but, but they're because, listen, if you have a great testimony, something that happened was we lived our life in sin for a while. Now, the amazing thing that God does is he, he does miracles with that. Even if you've lost 20 or 30 or 40 years of your life living in a certain area of sin, listen, when God comes into your life, he can restore that and miracles can happen. And he makes up for all the lost time. It's amazing what God does, but you have to do your part. And, you, and he's saying, listen, you don't have to live broken like this. But we spend our whole life chasing after the car somebody else has or a house that somebody else has or a lifestyle or even a relationship, what that looks like. Why do we do that? Because of the Tashuka curse. Your desire will be not only for his position, but everybody else's too. And we see this in the story of Cain and Abel uh, one generation later in the book of Genesis. And we'll get into that in another week. But why does Cain kill Abel? Because he is jealous. He has competitive envy of his brother. And in the first family, in the first generation, we have murder over this problem. So what do we do in our hearts to the community when somebody has the job we want, they have the stuff that we, in fact, why do we even, sometimes we live it this way. Call up a friend, call up with a, hey, you know what I got? Hey, I got this this week. Did you see that? Here, let me send you a picture. Let me put it on Facebook. This is what I got this week. Why do we do that? Because I want you to want it. I bought it so you could want it. Isn't that cool? Look, look what I got. I got a car. You don't have it. You should want it. <laughs> you can't have it. You're not as successful or whatever as me. So I got it. I want you to have it. Here's the picture. Look at it. Lust over it. Try to go get your own. Can't get it. This is what we do. Look how happy I am. Nobody's as happy as me. Selfie. 
Listen, I promise you, as most of you guys find me online, if I'm taking a selfie, I'm having no fun. <laughs> it is torture for most people that grew up like me to sit still for five minutes and take a picture. It's unbelievable that people do this to themselves on purpose. <laughs> it's proof to me that people love pain, right? Does they take time? Now, some of you guys love to do it. But if I take a selfie, I'm having zero fun and I'm faking it. I can just put it out there right now. I'm faking it. I don't want to take a picture. In fact, I don't want to do anything with the phone. Throw the phone away. Go do something fun. But wh why do we do this? Oh, I'm having fun. You can't have it. You want what I have because look how happy I am. And, and it could, the whole thing could be a lie. And we, sp we spend this time in competition with one another. But it ruins our church. It actually ruins our society and our community and it ruins all our relationships and we don't have to live that way because we have salvation from Christ. So, so God has promised all the dead things in our life, he remakes them alive, right? Our body doesn't last forever. This world doesn't last forever. It gets remade and we get saved. That's the deal. This is the great thing about God. He lets you have the free will in this broken world and you can choose to do whatever you want. You can, you can try to love, you can have another master if you want to. You can identify yourself as something besides a child of God if you want to. It's just not good for you. You're made in his image so you have the choice. This is the answer, by the way. But here's, here's the problem with that. You can be a saved, mature Christian and still be all about this broken life. And we don't want you to do that. We want you to have uh, the freedom in Christ where God repairs and restores you. And, and, and what, is, what happens? The church, we can serve everybody's family, but listen, we can grow their ministry for the first time. Why? Because we're not in competition. I'm not in competition with anybody here. Listen, what I'm trying to do is encourage and edify. This is the, this is the state of the church. This is what it's supposed to be when we do it right. Right, we encourage each other in our faith. We grow each other in our faith. This is why we teach and preach and have classes and small groups and we get together, why? And, and, and some of you are so hospitable to one another. Why, why do you do that? Why do you serve? Because by the way, that's what Jesus did. We earn opportunities with people when we serve like Jesus did. But when we're selfish, listen, you're living in the curse, the Tashuka curse, why? Because you're selfish because you're desiring the world, right? This is the right way to say it. This is the biblical way to say it. And why do you get so miserable sometimes? Why? You, you can't have what you want. And when you get what you want, it makes you miserable because it never fulfills God. It temporarily scratches the itch of sin called Teshuka. You will desire all the days of your life without God things that will never fill your heart. They'll never provide you security or freedom. They'll never provide salvation for you. And this is the truth message of the Bible. So will you believe it this morning? This message today is not a reminder. It's a fresh start. It's a way to remake your life so it can be useful to God. So everything you do is written in the book of life and you help grow God's kingdom through your ministry. That's why. So in a minute, we're getting ready to take communion like we do every week. If you've never been here before, but you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please feel free to get up and take communion. We want you to. Some people uh, pray together. Some people go back to their seats. It's okay, either way, whatever you'd like to do, however you'd like to take it. But when we do it today, um, let's answer a question. What will you admit that you need from God? Right? What will you admit that you need from God? Will we be honest enough? Because all the time we're praying to God when we're broken like this. We're praying, God, can I have a new house? God, can I have more money? God, can I have a new car? God, can I have, I desire these things. And, and, and you're praying in a curse. This is why. You're praying in a curse. This is what God tells us to change our prayer to. God, even though I've been far from you for 20, 30, 40 years. Even though I didn't live it this way, God, thank you for healing me. Now, would you go back and save the people that my sin hurt? Would you do that? Would you grow your kingdom and do the miracle in spite of me? Because I believe that I'm your child. I believe that 
You tell me I'm valuable. Sometimes I don't know why, Lord, but you tell me that and I believe it, amen, you're valuable. But listen, our desire changes from the world to what God cares about. And God cares about people. And so here's the prayer that God always answers. What do you need from God? If I need him to restore my life and save and heal people, and I pray, he always answers. He always answers. Your life will be so fun when you get up in the morning, you can't wait to see what God's gonna do next, right? But if you live in this curse, it's gonna be a hard life. You're always gonna question God, and you're always gonna doubt him, but you can change it in an instant and God will make up the lost time, amen? As we go to communion today, will you finally admit what you need from God? Will you do that? You gotta answer that yourself. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your Bible. We thank you for every single word of it that teaches us a way to be restored and renewed and set free. We thank you for that. Lord, I pray for the confidence and power of the congregation here at Cross the Line, every single person, that they be brave enough to ask you for what they need this morning. The world does not have what we need, but you have it. Thank you for that truth. We pray a blessing on everybody across the line church this morning as they make this decision. In Jesus' name, amen.